So when people talk about regulating stablecoins, they're not talking about in DeFi space. It's game over in that space. Just like Terra Luna went into a death spiral, I think we're in a death spiral now with fiat. This is why effectively why we went into Iraq because the US wanted to find its use case for its currency, the use case being oil settled in dollars. This is the other thing that the wealthy do is rather than selling your Bitcoin, which is a taxable event, by locking it up and generating stable cryptocurrencies, you're actually borrowing from yourself. So there's, you're not selling. So there's no capital gains to be paid off. G'day viewers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back onto the channel where today we're joined with Josh Shigala, a longtime friend of the channel, founder of Volturo and the Standard.io. Josh, how are you going? Good. Good to be back on the show, Adam. Josh, I've brought you on tonight because I want to talk to you about, first of all, the economic state of the world. We can see that we've got inflation in some countries, we've got hyperinflation in other countries. What's your take on fiat around the world? Is it all over or will we recover? It's a really interesting time, isn't it, Adam? Like what we're seeing is the US dollar really skyrocketing. And to me, that looks like a massive manipulation because everything else is tanking against that because it's just so strong. And I don't really understand why it is. They've got a president who can barely string a sentence together. It doesn't know really quite how to get off the stage. It was the only president that actually can fall up the stairs. And I'm not quite sure why, why that currency is going up. I do feel like there, there could be some macroeconomic reasons for that. But what does make sense is that everything in every country is getting more expensive. And of course, they're seeing that at the petrol pumps first. That's the major one at the gas station, filling up the car. That's really where it smacks you in the face. And um, of course, what delivers everything to the supermarkets uh, is the entire trucking and logistics industry, which also then has to bear that cost of fuel, which has that whole trickle down and inflationary spiral. So that can be triggered two ways. It can be triggered by the oil cartels around the world sort of fixing the prices or uh, a war, uh, let's say, between Russia and Ukraine and, and that sort of causing things. But what that feels like is a large excuse for the massive amount of money printing that has happened. And over the last two years, since 2020, since the whole COVID situation, and, and really, even COVID was an excuse. It was always heading this way. This was what the Bitcoiners thesis was. This is what Goldbug's thesis was, that we are heading towards a hyperinflation. Every fiat always heads towards that because it is much more, it is very unpopular to tax more the citizenry and promise all sorts of things, schools and bridges and such, rather than just printing it. <laughs> That's not as unpopular. So you sort of you know, socialize the devaluation rather than just stealing it off of directly from the payrolls. I'm concerned that we're seeing, if you will, the house of cards starting to collapse and the last card in this house will be the US dollar. It's nothing against the good people of the United States. It's just a mathematical and economic fact that all fiats always fail. They typically last 50 years. We're at the 50 year mark now. If we look at the delinking of gold from the US dollar in 1971 by Nixon, we're now at 51 years. History shows that this is the time that it should be occurring. Where to from here? How do we stop this without an utter collapse of fiat? They're talking about a CBDC. But in my opinion, a CBDC is just a worse fiat because it's a fiat with more control. How do you see fiat going in the future, if at all, and how a CBDC will be adopted by governments? You know, we're at a different time now where people can look at the state and say, look, if you screw this up, there's an exit door. And there always has been with gold in a way, and sometimes also debt and, and stuff like that, because you can... Well, very wealthy people could hedge inflation by actually getting into debt, effectively shorting the thing that, that was getting inflated. But really what cryptocurrencies allow is for people to say, there's an exit door. If you keep screwing with this money badly, because actually let's think about fiat for a second. Fiat is just another shit coin, right? If it's managed badly, then it'll go down in value. No one want to hold it. And if it's managed well, it can go on for a, quite a long time. I mean, it's got the full force of the society around it. 
It's got uh, armies and industry. You know, this is why effectively why we went into Iraq, because the US wanted to find its use case for its currency, the use case being oil settled in dollars uh, around the world. And uh, when Gaddafi and, and Saddam were trying to make a gold settlement layer, uh, you know, that's just not on. And, and you can see that as a crypto person. If you're a crypto project, I remember this in Bitcoin, man, could you imagine if Amazon took Bitcoin, that use case, that would be just immense and amazing. And it's the same thing for the States. Could you imagine if the whole world has to settle in our currency? Wow, that's a great use case. That'll bring the value up. And really, this is what's so beautiful about cryptocurrency is that it starts to get people thinking and understanding the really the basics of money. Now, back to your question of can they turn it around? I, 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 think, I think not because just like Terra Luna went into a death spiral, I think we're in a death spiral now with fiats. It's like a crack addict saying, can, can we get this crack addict who's been on crack for like 40 years and just go, you know, just come off it and start a normal life? Mm, probably not. Like it's very, very unlikely without extreme help and inter interventions that are very, very painful for the crack addict. It's, it's not going to happen. And so you really want to uh, have... The, and no government wants to cause pain on the citizenry because they'll be voted out. So game theoretically, uh, it, it sort of set the game, the chessboard set to fail, to be checkmated. The, the game's already playing out and you can see it's we're one step away. And th there's not much that really can be done. All I'm already hearing murmurs of more bailouts. We see Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse now in deeper shit than they were back in 2009, 2008. And so this is being pushed under the carpets, but all of this was going to happen anyway. And COVID was a nice boogeyman to point out and say, that's the reason. Now the war in the Ukraine is the next reason. So it's just sort of finger pointing. It's, it's really important for everybody to not have knee jerk reactions and just point to a single reason but to realize that systemically a fiat system is uh, is basically corrupted in its logic. These disasters that you speak of, I um, remember saying sort of tongue in cheek that Putin cured COVID. And what I meant yeah. by that is if you actually look at the COVID timeline, the same week that COVID finished, if you will, that's when Russia started up. It was literally, yeah. we stepped from one stepping stone of financial disaster blamed on something else to a new thing, which was the Putin price hike or the Putin tax. And it's like, well, what if this thing ends? What's next? And I've also read that the last round of COVID and lockdowns was basically priming the population and testing the population to see how far they could push them. What's very concerning to me though, Josh, is that you mentioned Iraq and Gaddafi in Libya. And what was interesting about that is of course, it's exactly as you said, we had these two countries saying, well, we're not going to use the petrodollar, which is the US dollar. We're going to try and trade in something else. Well, of course, bombs and bullets rocked up on their doorstep. Both men were taking it out and it was for looking for weapons of mass destruction, which never existed, or it was looking for human rights to take out a bad leader. But ultimately what was really happening in the background, of course, is that someone was taking on the US dollar. What concerns me now is that we can see that China and Russia are pushed out of the US dollar. Well, Russia's pushed out of it, certainly with sanctions. China is opting to be stepping aside from the US dollar. And we can now see that there is no way that the same game that we played with Gaddafi and Hussein could be played with Xi and Putin. That is, you can't take them on in the same way that you took foreign leaders who are now deceased on. So what's also interesting in this case study for me, and this real life case study that we're living at the moment, is that we've seen India a massive nation that we shouldn't underestimate. They've actually been getting cheap deals on oil from Russia. So whilst we're talking about war and oil and pandemics and weapons of mass destruction, the core of it is money. And the core of that money is broken because they just keep printing it. So when we look at, if you will, the evolution, do you think it will be done by force? Will it be done peacefully? Or will it be something in between? Oh, uh, you know, I, I obviously want it to be peaceful, but if you look historically, it's always goes out with a bang. The problem is generally after a while, and this we see this in the Roman times, the army starts just to get pissed off because they stopped getting paid. 
back then they would shave bits of the silver off and as you know some poor i don't know 15 year old kid is at some outpost in the middle of whoop whoop somewhere that hasn't seen uh you know his family or or anything else and it was a different time back then obviously um for years and and is just sort of rotting in the heat and then doesn't get paid eventually they just they either revolt or they just throw their arms down and just say screw it and this is the thing if you have a massive war machine and empire to uphold and you can't uphold it any longer you either get no one rocking up at, at your wars anymore or you'll get a full on revolution which generally uh, can happen and that that's what's frightening but i'm kind of like you said with covid and then a week later putin was like can we have a summer can we just have a break for a month just give us one month you know no no it was straight into the next fear boogeyman and while it's a serious situation i'm not diminishing it a country just invading another country is just not on like you know i was up in the streets against the us invading afghanistan i was against the us invading iraq uh, and i'm against russia invading ukraine but i'm also self-aware enough to realize that there's more at play than that and so now we're at this sort of very very strange juncture where we've got a technical revolution happening in currency we've got two superpowers at war for the first time in a very long time if you look in the past you know america's only ever picked on people that they know that they can win against you know they didn't go into saudi arabia after 9/11 when supposedly the hijackers were saudi arabian no they went into iraq and it had nothing to do with anything they went into syria syria obviously it's like, you know you're not going to invade uh, in syria syria if they were were big in just growing i don't know poppy flowers or no maybe poppy flowers they would but mm -hmm. but uh, let's say uh, tulips you know obviously it's resources and small fry that they know that they can win now we're looking at technologically a massive revolution in currency which is a very big attack vector which they cannot stop and this was the first time this what satoshi this is why he stayed anonymous or she or it or they because it, uh, you know uh, all of these people gaddafi and such i know it's a conspiracy theory but there's a there's, there's a lot of reasons why that could be a definite why they were taking out taken out like you don't see there's plenty of dictators in this world there's plenty of absolute awful despots and they're not being taken out by the states funny that the only ones taken out are the ones that wanted to create an alternative to the petrodollar petro settlement system so i think there's this precipice that we're sitting at right now with cbdc's with crypto with two major superpowers at each other's throats and the most powerful nation on earth definitely losing its foothold in terms of its, its uh well its strength and confidence so everyone's obviously going to move to a cbdc because my argument is that everyone uses digital money anyway we're already in the digital age even though some people believe that no we've got cash that we already know and it's a fact that no one even tries to hide this that if everyone did a run on the banks to try and take out their cash there's physically not enough cash because we're already digital. So we move into a CBDC, and the argument that I've heard is that the governments are going to make you use your CBDC. That is, if I'm in Australia, I have to use the Australian CBDC. In America, I have to use theirs, and so forth. But then it goes back to the global reserve currency. What will be the global reserve currency? Do I want to accept America's unlimited CBDC, China's unlimited CBDC, Australia's unlimited CBDC, or do I want to accept a scarce Bitcoin or a stable coin that's connected or linked to something scarce. What do you foresee will happen with countries rolling out their CBDCs? You know, I, I think there's a lot of, we need to really take CBDCs a little bit with a grain of salt. First of all, what is it? Because it's often linked to blockchains. And as we can see, blockchains in its current decentralized form are very, very hard to scale. We have the best engineers in the world all competing with a very, very incentivized structure to try to find the answer. 
and it not quite being there yet. Layer twos are there. If you look at Lightning Network, it's very scalable. It's technologically not fully there yet, but it's close. We have layer twos on, on Ethereum, which are also very close. Not quite there yet, but very close. Very confusing. <laughs> and uh, and definitely not for the masses yet. So what generally people talk about when they talk about CBDCs is forget the blockchain. Forget any of that for a second. What you're actually talking about is removing retail banks from the entire monetary system where they create new money by issuing debt, usually in the form of corporate or mortgage debt. And that's what inflates the currency and paying off those debts deflates it. Instead, everyone would have accounts at the central bank. And the central bank keeps a database of this stuff and would still have an international settlement system because their internal database needs to match up with something that's being traded with China's CBDC. Now, the problem with this whole thing is that if your central bank gets hacked, then it's game over. It's, it's a very, very, very dangerous thing to have a centralized honeypot for your entire country's economy uh, sitting at a one database that can be attacked by a foreign country and adversary that might want to challenge you instead of going to war. Hey, let's just hack their central bank and bankrupt everybody. Look, the fact of the matter is that Bitcoin is so sensational because it is truly decentralized and the function of everybody around the world anonymously being able to hash everything that's happening in the last 10 minutes, as well as the last hash of the last block, really is an amazing feat in security, in digital security. But it's too slow. It's got, it's got some drawbacks. It's extremely secure, but it's not scalable as yet. You know, obviously, that some people will say, ours is, ours is scalable, but we've seen it. Look, you can look at even Cardano, you can look at some of these other chains that say they're scalable. As soon as they start to scale, they get more expensive. And, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason why that will never go away. I come from the 3D animation world originally. I, I started as an animator a long time ago. And uh, it's just a, a little bit of analogy to stick with me here. So when I started, we were working on these massive silicon graphics supercomputers. They were like fridges, big, big machines. And over time, uh, Alias Wavefront turned to Maya and started being ported onto PC. And PCs even back then maybe had like half a gig of RAM, then a gig of RAM, and then four gigs of RAM. And everyone's was like, whoa, four gigs, we're never going to use this much RAM. But what happened is that clients just wanted more. Ah, oh, well, now we want to have full ocean simulations. And now we want subsurface scattering beneath the skin. So the light bounces and the ray tracing, we want triple ray trace. Now we want 4K. Now we want 8K renders. So what happened over time, now that we've got like, you know, terabytes of RAM and all this stuff, render times actually didn't change that much because you just got more computing power, but you actually still had that much render time because you just wanted more. You want a bigger, better, more stuff, more polys. And the, the similar thing will happen with blockchains is that if you scale to larger and larger, people will just have more and more dApps. The other thing that happens is that right now, the smart contracts that we're writing for the standard.io is that we have to look at every single line of code and go over it with a fine tooth code and really optimize that to the nth degree because every extra bit of code is more gas that people are going to pay. And the more optimized it is, the easier it is to also find bugs in the smart contract. Now, if you have infinite space and you don't care about optimization, you just, ah, and you just start throwing stuff, you start to also get a lot more bugs. You start to just throw out anything. You start having abstraction layers on top of different codes. So instead of in Solidity, you'd like to do it in JavaScript and that just compiles down to solidity or something. And so you just get more and more crap in there. And so however much you scale inside the blockchain, you'll just get more and more people throwing stuff, more and more dApps and worse and worse code and more and more stuff. So really at the end of the day, the only way you can actually deal with scalability or what goes into that is with a price feedback mechanism to say, hey, this is going to be costly. So you better sort of <laughs> Price feedback is an amazing tool. And by just saying, 
we have like you know every transaction is or every smart contract delivered here is you know sub cent that's a tricky call and maybe it'll work maybe i'm proven wrong but i do feel that it's a tricky one and so cbdc's have this issue as well so I, I do believe that we're at a stage where we're getting threats that these CBDCs will be around the corner, but I don't think they actually have the technology as yet to be fully scalable. If they do, then it won't be a full blockchain. It'll be a huge honeypot. It'll probably get hacked. But in the meantime, what's happening? The states or the, go the governments of around the world will really use this to absolutely crush the freedoms that you have. The, the gig economy, most of the gig economy works with tips and tips is all the black money, you know, floating around. Tips is all tax free, but this is a very important part of the economy. You know, as much as people hate to hear that, oh, tax free is, is terrible. Well, actually, it's a really, really important part of the economy. All these little $2 tips and two euro tips that you give to the Lee Ferrando, to the, you know, the Uber Eats driver plays a role and a very, very important role uh, in the economy. And the CBDCs will absolutely destroy this. So I'm, I'm going on this huge sort of rant there and I'm taking you from, <laughs> from one place. From that, That's why I bring you on. So as I've mentioned before in previous videos, we share the same values, but your technical background is way superior to mine. So we start on you know, laid the foundation for the values of what's happening around the world. But then I learned so much from you from the technical aspect, which is got kind of actually weaving into the standard.io. We can see the value of Bitcoin, but we can see the weakness of it, as you said, with the scalability. We can see the potential use cases for things like CBDCs. How does your project differ from, in the first instance, Bitcoin, and then in the second instance, CBDCs? First of all, why why are stable coins important stable coins are really really important because hey nobody knows how much a carton of milk costs in bitcoin or gold or anything else they know how much it costs in their local currency they know how much it costs in indian rupee in Aust aussie dollars if they're in australia in british pounds and yeah there's a little bit of there's always movement then there's no such thing as stability there's always entropy in this universe so you know, to say total stability is wrong, but it's it's important to have something that people are used to calculating in. That's why I don't think Bitcoin has taken off as quickly as it should. I mean, I've been in Bitcoin since the very beginning and it's still not where it is. In fact, Bitcoin was around before Alipay did anything. It's been bloody, we used to celebrate like when, you know, back when Roger Ver was still in Team BTC, He'd go into like a, a some shop and convert them and everyone be on the forums. Yeah, you know, we got another shop. The thing is that Alipay came along and basically in like a year made that most shops, when I came to Australia, at least around the airports and around like tourist areas, all had all of a sudden Alipay. And I was like, how come Bitcoin can't do this in two years? Why, why isn't everyone accepting Bitcoin? And the reason we is because the calculations people need to do, I feel is just too difficult for mainstream adoption, plus the accounting. And then obviously there's like bad press and oh, only drug dealers and all this other stuff that Bitcoin's had to deal with. But that's a big part of it. So stable coins will help with the, the adoption of decentralized currency. And to your other question of how we do this, well, you know, I'm an old school gold bug. I launched the world's first Bitcoin physical gold exchange in 2015 and called Voltoro.com. And it's still going strong. But I, I, I still like the fact in my economic dream of having currency backed by money, meaning gold, currency backed by real value. You know, we saw algorithmic stable coins coming along, Terra Luna, we've saw, well, Terra Luna is only the latest one. I mean, we've we've seen Waves, we've seen BitShares, we've seen a whole bunch try the algorithmic stable coin thing. And that is basically a stable coin that's, back, that's backed by nothing but fluff. It's backed by its own governance tokens. It's a different topic, but where I really want to focus on is allowing users to lock up rare assets like Bitcoin, like Ethereum or tokenized gold into smart contracts and then borrow basically like a central bank does borrow against those assets in a stable coin. Now those are then locked up in a, in a vault that only you have the private key to. So this isn't like 
you know, not your keys, not your, not your crypto, it still holds strong. So when you basically have some Bitcoin, you don't want to sell it. You, you need to buy a car. You, you put that in this smart vault, uh, which is a smart contract. You lock it. You have the private key, but you can't unlock it until you pay back the loan that you took, that you generated. So when you lock it, you say, okay, I want to borrow up to 50% of the value that's in there. It prints out some new stable coins and that's linked to either Australian dollars or euros or US dollars or Indian rupees, Turkish lira, whatever the liquidity you're at. And then if you want to get out more value that you've locked up, you have to buy that back off the market, pay it. It burns those stable coins, you unlock it. That's the standard in a nutshell. And I think it's a really, really important thing to release uh, at this stage because as CBDCs get closer, they're starting to look absolutely nightmarish. I saw recently out of China, they're trialing a CBDC where the currency just uh, has an expiration date. Mm. So if you get paid in this CBDC, then you've got to spend it within N number of days, otherwise it is invalid. And this is a really sick, demented, it basically says that you're, because what is money? Money is your labor stored in a piece of paper, really, and effectively, like apart from if you inherit a whole bunch, then you're inheriting your grandfather's labor. But you're putting work in daily, and now you've got this thing that you're storing that labor in, that energy. And for the state to just go, oh, well, you better move that, otherwise it, it won't work anymore. And the good thing is, with crypto, we've seen these experiments played out already. Someone's already done this in a crypto, but in a voluntary way <laughs> to say, hey, what do you guys think of this? That might create more velocity and maybe more people use it as currency because they don't want to hodl it. So rather it gets moved around and people have an actual cryptocurrency. This one was called Flycoin. It's, uh, it was the first Demarage coin launched in 2012. And it absolutely plummeted, obviously had the hype right at the start where everyone was like, wow, great idea. And no one wants to hold something that no one wants to get paid in something that's a losing value. So well, this is the beautiful thing about crypto is we can try out these economic theories uh, without force or violence and see if they work or fail. And I tell you, these CBDCs, they're absolutely horrific. The other one I heard beyond an expiry date was actually a location perimeter. So imagine we have another lockdown and they say, right, you can't cross the border. Well, you can physically shut down the border, but then you've got another avenue now that where you try and spend your money in Sydney and it's good, but then you try and spend it in Brisbane and it doesn't work. And not only doesn't it work, when you try and spend it, it flags a little alert to say, oh, Adam's in Brisbane when he should be in Sydney, sending the boys in blue. And so suddenly this freedom of association, this freedom of expression, which is your freedom of storing your time and energy into, as you said, a piece of paper or some type of unit, it's being eroded away very quickly. And it actually terrifies me. It terrifies me to think that whatever draconian methods that we know now, it's got to be taken to a whole new level. When we look at the standard.io and some of the things that you can link to, we've spoken about gold and Bitcoin and different currencies. I had a thought experiment the other day. Do you think a company could perhaps come to you and say, hey, Josh, we want to make a stable coin for cans of Coke. So someone knows that they're going to buy a thousand cans of Coke over the next 10 years. Therefore, to avoid inflation or price fluctuations or supply chain issues or whatever, they can invest $1,000 into us, which gives the user 1,000 stable coins. And each one of those stable coins is worth one can of Coke. And because you're putting this money into us now, we're going to give you a 10% discount. And as a result, the user, if you will, or the purchaser, they get 1,000 cans of Coke in advance at a 10% discount. But the Coca-Cola company, as an example, they've just suddenly raised all of this capital. And we know what actually happens with a lot of these tokens or gift cards you may like to look at. Sometimes they're never spent. So on one hand, the user gets a set price for the can of Coke and a discount for buying it early. At the other end, the Coke company raises all of this revenue. Do you foresee that that model could work with different companies and call it a stable coin per se? Yeah, absolutely. If there is a large enough conglomerate on a supermarket chain or something that's that has their um, their currency um, and they issue a stable coin through the standard where they they always back it to this is worth one chicken. <laughs> yeah, it could definitely. I mean, there's there's other really cool ideas that I've been having about 
other currencies. Um, we saw in Myanmar had like a happiness index for a while. I think it was Myanmar. This was like in the 90s. Or was it Tibet? I'm not sure. But these are sorts of interesting things as well. Like if you could peg a stable coin to, to a happiness index of a region, so the value of the currency actually goes up, the happier the people are because it's pegged to the happiness. <laughs> So these are these are these are weird, crazy edge edge cases. But our main focus right now is to focus on the launch of the S Euro, which is the Euro stablecoin, and it'll be fully backed by individuals locking up assets uh, into their smart vaults. Actually, how we're launching the very first MVP, which will really get the uh, the yield farmers excited, is to offer basically. Uh, let me step back a bit. One of the things that we're doing different from MakerDAO, which was the first to really invent the over collateralized stablecoin idea. One of the things that I didn't like about Maker is that there's this stability fee, which is effectively an interest rate. And so how do you get away from interest being at the base money? If we're inventing a new base currency around the world, then you don't want interest being there at that base level. I just feel it's not a good thing to have rent seeking at the base. So there's nothing wrong with interest. If you have money, if I give you money from my own savings, then I have an opportunity cost there that I could be using to fix my house up or lend to someone else. So in that area, I'm okay charging interest. That for me is quite morally sound. But if I'm charging interest on money that's being printed out of thin air, it's just know, icky. Sounds and, like a fee and fractional actually, reserve lending. Well, yeah, it's it's absolutely fractional reserve lending, and it's uh, and it's one of the core principles of the problems that we're seeing in the world. But with this system, uh, what we're doing with the standard.io is the the smart contract. You will lock up assets, and we actually will garner a large stability pool in the first launch of the S Euro. So, what I mentioned with the smart vaults is is the second stage of our release plan. The first stage is where people um, and yield farmers and DeFi, people in DeFi will take advantage of this, where we actually will, uh, our smart contracts will release S Euro on a, on a discount curve. So at first S Euro will be 80 cents. So it won't be, it won't be a stable coin yet until this really pulls filled up. In the beginning, it'll be 80 cents on the Euro. So people will be able to buy one S Euro for 80 cents. So it's a really good deal. And the more value that comes into the stability pool, as that pool fills up, that discount gets less and less and less until it reaches one euro. So one to one. So one S euro is one euro. And by that stage, there should be a fair amount of value sitting in the stability pool. And this stability pool is basically what keeps the stablecoin stable. So that's stage one. And then stage two, there's a bonding pool as well. I won't bore you, your viewers with the details. I would definitely recommend you come over to the standard.io and check it out if you're interested in in yield farming and learning how to make money in, in DeFi. If I may, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Let's backtrack on, on what you were saying there. So you're launching the standard.io, or sorry, the company already exists, but you're launching the S Euro, which is a stable coin linked to the Euro. Yeah. What I'm hearing is you're building up a liquidity pool and stability in that. And the risk that I take is getting in there early, but the return I get, risk versus reward, is I'm essentially getting 20% off a future euro. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's, okay. that's exactly right. Okay, so then once you've built up your stability pool, I've put in, say, $1,000, I've got a 20% discount, so I'm 200 bucks ahead. Once yep. we're good to go and we're rock and rolling, then how do I get yield off that? So if I'm not, if I'm in Australia, yeah. so I don't need the S Euro, or unless I'm perhaps buying something online that wants the S Euro, which is a free market. Mm -hmm. How would I generate some type of income on this project? Yeah, so um, that's, so stage one is what you mentioned there. Now you're holding these 1,200 S Euro. Um, the next thing is a bonding curve that that we offer in this, in this DeFi smart contract. So what that means is that uh, you place your S euro and your, um, let's say, USDT or DAI or some counter asset into a liquidity pool, like on, on Uniswap. And for doing that, what we do is we buy that liquidity back off you for a bond. What a bond is, for those listeners that don't know, is basically 
a, a contract that states that, hey, this bond has a maturity date and that's like seven days or a month or three months. And when that matures, you will get back more value than you put in, but in TST, which is the governance token of the standard. So if you put in 1,200 of the SUO that you got plus 1,200 of USDT, that's sort of 2,400, let's say, then you'll get back like 3,000 euros worth of TST after that month is out. So now you've turned your 1,000 to 3,000. Why have we done that? We've done that because you're helping build the standard. You're helping build that liquidity pool up and making sure that there's always enough liquidity, that there's more liquidity there than S euros floating around. So anyone at any time can always take the S euro, send it back to the liquidity pool, and they'll get one euro worth of Ethereum or one euro worth of some other asset out. And that's really what keeps any stable coin stable is, can I get one euro or $1 worth of assets for this stable coin? And then because this is only a limited offer, this is how to build the stability pool. After that is when we launch the ability for people to, um, to have the smart vaults, the personal smart vaults to lock up assets and generate more SUOs. But I guess the other question that will come to mind is, well, what's this governance token meant to do for me? <laughs> now that I'm holding 3,000 bucks worth of TST, which is the standard token, what will that do? How I see it is that once private vaults come out, there's a, there's a minting fee. So imagine if you got paid every time a central bank or a bank minted new currency in the world. So we will be enabling people to mint every major fiat on the planet. We can see analysts have stated that the stablecoin space will reach about a trillion dollars in the next five years, uh, three years, actually, they've said it. So imagine every time a stablecoin is minted, there's a small fee taken rather than an interest rate because an interest rate is uh, based on a percentage. There's a small fee just on the minting process. Uh, and that gets dropped into the treasury. So it's part of the treasury of the standard to make sure we can do marketing and biz dev and all that stuff that Alipay actually could do. Go from shop to shop and make sure people actually accept this stuff. But also the ability to airdrop that onto TST holders that are staking their TST and voting and doing things like that. But also TST holders will be able to buy liquidated assets under spot. So if someone's locked up a whole bunch of currency and they can't pay off that debt and it gets liquidated, then it liquidates automatically down to TST holder stakers that want to buy liquidated assets under spot. So there's a whole lot of reasons why you would want to hold that. So you go from holding some, some Ethereum, you convert that to SUO, you bond that SUO into liquidity pool, and then you get TST, and then you can stake that TST to get these rewards. And that's kind of the, the steps to launch the first SUO. It sounds very complex, but there's a whole lot of reasons why those steps are there. And, and it's getting a lot of people quite excited in the yield farming space. Is there a minimum buy-in to get into this space? And actually, let me backtrack. Before we talk about that, are you raising money through an ICO or are you just doing this yourself? No, no, we, we did a small um, raise through Voltoro because we've, you know, we've been in the game. We're very trusted. Uh, Voltoro has never been hacked. We're very good at security. We, we run Voltoro since 2015. And so people are like, oh, wow, those guys at Voltoro are splitting half the team off to create the standard. I, I want to be part of that. So we raised a small round with them about a year ago, and we basically hired a team and the team's based out of Berlin, London, and, uh, and France as well. And uh, there's a couple of other places around the world. So it's, a, it's a quite a decentralized team and building out the DAO structure with those funds and building the smart contracts, auditing the smart contracts and um, getting people on board. So now that that part is locked away, what's the minimum buy-in if I want to put some money in to get that 20% discount on the S euro? There's, there's no minimum. The thing that's important is that when I got into Bitcoin, it was about banking the unbanked. It was about helping the small guys and not just the big guys. It's about being as egalitarian as possible. And, and this is really what we're trying to focus on is that anybody can get in. Obviously, you want to get in early on that discount curve because the more liquidity that comes in, the, the less that discount becomes. Uh, so I would definitely recommend jumping on the site and jumping on our Discord and being an active member there. We're about to launch a whole bunch of stuff. What I'm really excited about, actually, Adam, is decentralizing this out more and more 
into um, DWORK, which is a great decentralized working platform where uh, jobs are tasked out as bounties and people can come in and make suggestions like, oh, hey, I create videos or I create animations. I suggest you guys do that. And so there's all these sorts of things that can be done. And we also post bounties up there and, and people start working for the DAO. And, uh, we're, you know, it's, this is a really exciting time to come in and join the community and build this thing out. I mean, I, I really see this as a revolution. You know, it's a, it's a way, well, it's an evolution. It's a peaceful evolution of money. We've gone from Bitcoin, which is still there. It's still going to be number one. It's it's the thing. But it's it's more of, it's like the gold. It's like a store of value that you want to speculate on. What we're building really is the currency, a decentralized currency that is fully scalable uh, using layer twos on EVM compatible chains and as well as being cross-chain. But there's some really interesting tech that we're building out, especially in the smart vault areas. Once we release the smart vaults, the personal smart vaults, where you can lock up assets and generate new um, stable coins from that. Things like the ability to automatically swap collateral if the collateral is tanking. So we saw in this crypto winter, Celsius go basically bankrupt because they had all this stuff locked up that they couldn't liquidate. They couldn't get out. We saw massive amounts of maker vaults just being liquidated to hell. So we want to try to stop that as much as possible. Obviously, we have ways in place where TST stakers can buy those liquidators assets because the system always needs to have more collateral locked up than there is stable coins floating around. This is the whole underpinning of the currency. More value has, has to be sitting there holding up the value of this currency that's floating about in these stable coins. But imagine if you could, as it's tanking and you can't pay it off, you could automatically swap the collateral over to a tokenized gold or something that's not in the crypto space. This is a huge step forward. The other thing we're looking at is, let's say you have a, a debt that you've taken out to yourself. And by the way, I want to touch on this a little bit of why taking debt out in inflation is really important. One of the things you can do if you've taken debt out from yourself by locking up assets in a smart vault and printing crypto like stable coins, if you can't pay that debt off, let's say you've lost your job and you've bought this car and you've got more value locked up than you, you know, it's yours, you've got the key, you just can't unlock it until you pay back that loan that you borrowed from yourself. You can actually, uh, what we're building in is you can take that loan and sell it as an NFT to somebody else and they can pay off the debt and take out the collateral. So now you have the ability to actually sell collateralized debt positions on the open market for yourself privately rather than, you know, these ridiculous hedge funds. And, and in so, privacy as well, of course, in that situation. Right, right. Um, absolutely. Great point. And so that's a, that's a really unique selling point that we're building here at The Standard. And so... Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things. Another thing we're really working hard on in the R&D department is cross-chain minting because we, we don't know which chain is going to win out in the end. I definitely feel that Ethereum is going to be there. Uh, you know, we've had Ethereum killers for the last, like since 2017, everyone, you know, EOS and Tron and, you know, they all go by the wayside and Ethereum is still there. And, and yeah, it's got high fees, but uh, it's expensive to live in uh, Berlin as well. It's expensive to live in Sydney. Why? Because it's a cool city to live in. <laughs> it's expensive to work in Ethereum because it's a cool place to be. Uh, everyone's there, the liquidity's there. And like I mentioned at the start of the interview with the fact that high prices are always going to be in blockchains because of the fact that there's just more there's insatiable appetite that humans have for space <laughs> and they'll take it up you see this is why i love working with you beyond our values is that you keep it real so if i may when you say that bitcoins it's there it's number one it'll always be number one what i've experienced is that so many people have come into the crypto land they loved bitcoin they understood bitcoin but then they thought oh i'm going to make a better bitcoin and you might look at you know at its core, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin Black, Bitcoin Gold. Well, a lot of those were just shills. But then you had other coins that were going to do a better, faster job. Maybe to an extent Litecoin, but I actually don't see Litecoin and Bitcoin competing. I see them operating in unison. But what you're saying is you're saying, look, I can see what Bitcoin does. And I, I give the same argument. Bitcoin is Bitcoin. For me, Bitcoin's like the Toyota Corolla. It's there. It's reliable. It's not particularly fast or sexy. But damn, it's reliable and it's the best selling yeah. car in the world for good reason. When people say, yeah, but it's not a Ferrari, if you will, it's like, yeah, it's not meant to be a Ferrari. And they say, yeah, and it's not a truck. It's like, 
it's not a truck. It's just a Toyota Corolla. It's just there. It's reliable. So when you're coming in, and I share this with the viewers, I like your values. I like what you're doing. I found you from listening from millions of podcasts. And I'm like, I need to speak to this guy. We had a conversation. We got on very well. Then I learned about your project. I'm like, I want to learn more about this. So well done to you, if I may, if I can say this publicly, well done for not compromising the big picture. And the big picture is Bitcoin does what it does. And then when we look at Ethereum, when people say it's crap because there's all these Ethereum killers because the gas fees are too high, I say, look, the free market has spoken and the free market has said, we like Ethereum. And I actually don't even say nothing will beat Ethereum. I say, you know what? Some projects may be better than Ethereum, but if the market has chosen Ethereum and the market's willing to build on it and pay the fees, that's democracy. That's the free market. What yeah. your project's doing is you're not actually coming in here and saying, we're going to be a better Bitcoin or we're going to be a better Ethereum. You're actually saying we're going to be a better money. Now, whether you want to use the Euro, gold, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you're saying we don't discriminate against money. You get to choose your value. We're going to add a solution so you can not only move and mint this, but also earn some money. And as you said, have the opportunity to privately and instantly sell debt when you might get in trouble, which can happen to all of us. My well done. I'm really excited about the project. Thank you very much for your kind words. It's really nice to hear. And no, I like, you know, this is the amazing thing about Bitcoin and, and how the standard works with it is that you'll be able to take wrapped Bitcoin and actually lock it up as an asset and then borrow stable coins off you and use it as a currency. And this is the, there's a small, tiny little difference that people, a lot of people don't understand. There's the difference between currency and money, whereas money is actual value that can also be used as a currency, whereas currency is generally, hasn't really got any value. What's backing it is the value and the currency is the thing that floats around. So anything can be currency, like um, some cigarettes, but cigarettes is even more of a money because it's also can be used, you know, it can be smoked. Whereas paper is a true currency. It's, it's just by fiat of the state of the government that's backing the value. So the standard uh, really hopes to take the value of Bitcoin and lock it up. And I just wanted to quickly touch on what is really important about debt in these times. Generally, what the wealthy have done during hyperinflationary cycles is that they've taken out a hell of a lot of debt. But the normal person can't just take out debt because we've seen this in multiple countries where the banks just reevaluate the debt through a hyperinflationary cycle and you end up paying the same even though it's hyperinflated. Whereas the wealthy have negotiated contracts specifically with the banks to say, you're not allowed, this is fixed interest. And you're not allowed to revaluate the debt afterwards. What does this mean? It means that you buy a house right now with, I don't know, a million dollars. And then in 10 years time, a million dollars buys you a car. So effectively, you've bought your house with the value of a car or a carton of milk. So effectively, you've paid off a house with a carton of milk. So what the standard allows, because it's zero interest, is allows people to basically... Uh, and I've talked to a few people who said, man, I'm paying off my mortgage straight away by locking up assets, taking a loan out at zero interest, paying my mortgage off with that. And now I've got an interest-free loan in a stable coin, like let's say it's, it's euros and euros goes down and down and gets hyperinflated. Hey, in 10 years time, I get to pay off my debt, my house with a carton of milk effectively because in inflation is a type of negative interest almost like it's a it's a way of basically paying off your debt because you know it's devaluating your debt there's an extension to what you just said there where they pay off the house immediately with a loan they now can actually claim a tax deduction on paying back that loan depending how they took it out and this is how the rich get richer like unbelievably rich they've got a million dollar house they suddenly have or with a million dollar loan they come across a million dollars very quickly getting rid of that debt and then borrowing against it so you can then claim it against your tax you know the options are unlimited and what i actually foresee adam's crystal ball with your project when People say to me, they say, I can't spend Bitcoin anywhere. And it's a fair question. When they say, well, if I can't spend it anywhere, why, why would I get it? So I always reach into my pocket, I pull out a credit card and I say, this credit card is simply a gateway into whatever value there is on it. If I'm in America 
I can't use the Australian dollar, but I can if I'm using this credit card. And the same in Europe, no matter where I go in the world, with this credit card, I can tap on it. And whatever's happening in the background, let the computers and the banks and the algorithm, whatever, let them sort it out. Mm. When you extrapolate that into crypto, it doesn't matter what's in it, whether it's Bitcoin or Litecoin or a billion crons or whatever it is. Yeah. The point is, it's really that on and off ramp with the vendor itself when you're doing this. Yep. So I foresee, and I don't know if I'm guessing something that you're already doing, but just from talking to you and understanding, if you will, how money moves through hands, I actually foresee you creating a credit card because then these stable coins, whatever it's backed by, when I want to actually spend them, instead of going to a computer and pulling it out and transferring it, I can just tap and pay in the background. Do you foresee a card coming as part of your project further down the road? Yeah, it was one of the very first things we started. Actually, you know, you guessed spot on. Like we really were thinking about that. But the thing is, we're really focusing on the protocol level, on the decentralized protocol. But what we are doing is our biz dev team are already talking to credit card vendors to be able to accept the stable coins, S Euro, S USD, S INR, and all, all the rest of them. So the big point there is we have to wait until liquidity is high enough that those credit cards can like basically once you swipe, it can liquidate that very quickly into the local currency. And that that's being set up in the background. So that's a definite a spot on. And really the key there is that's exactly the point. That's the sore point that regulators will go after. Those on and off ramps, that's the pinching spot. So when people talk about regulating stable coins, they're not talking about in DeFi space. It's game over in that space. People will be trading NFTs and in-game items and stable coins and stuff in their DEXs and there's nothing they can do about it. What they can do is say, ah, well, you need a full KYC for this and that and you need to pull down your pants and show everything before you can have this debit card, you know. So that's just a, so, you know, to make sure expectations are set there in the future, I think regulators, and when I say regulators, I'm actually talking the legacy banking system because they use the regulatory arm as their enforcement arm to basically steal the industry or, or crush industries. So that's a definite thing there. And, and you mentioned tax before, and this is the other thing that the wealthy do is rather than selling your Bitcoin, which is a taxable event, by locking it up and generating stable cryptocurrencies, you're actually borrowing from yourself. So there's, you're not selling. So there's no capital gains to be paid off there. You've just got a loan out. Yeah, you've borrowed money from yourself, which is also a strange concept outside of pawn shops, but you've borrowed from yourself. Like even a pawn shop, they're lending you money. It's a third party here. It's a smart contract that you're controlling yourself. And so for the first time, you can put your own value in, turn the key, print new, brand new stable coins, have them buy, uh, you know, trade them to actual euros or, or someone accepts them directly, be able to pay for stuff there and not have a taxable event. I mean, that's extraordinary and a, and a huge uh, win. And the exciting part, of course, is that everyone is learning this at a younger age. They're learning it from YouTube. They're learning it from watching their mates do it. Because in the past, let's face it, only those at the very top with financial backgrounds, we're not taught this in school. And now we're, we're learning this everywhere. People are understanding money, they're understanding markets, they're understanding the scam that is fiat. So it's not just coming up against, if you will, regulators against governments or competitors within markets themselves. We might say Visa versus MasterCard, which I argue is operating as an oligopoly anyway. We now actually have organizations such as yourself and commentators such as myself and all the kids coming up saying, well, hang on a second, I can be part of these markets and what is money? And why do I have to use your money? Why can't I use my money? And hopefully if it's not backed up with bombs or bullets, we can just back it up with the free market and we can determine what value is. How can people get involved? Where do we go to from here, Josh? I mean, you can, uh, you know, you can follow us on Twitter at the standard underscore IO. You can go to thestandard.io here. I'm sure you'll put a link in the description. I would really recommend joining the Discord or joining the Telegram if that's more your thing, just to stay in touch with what we're doing. But also put your email down, as many touch points as possible, because you really don't want to miss out on the IBCO, which is the initial bonding curve uh, offering that, we're, that I was talking about before to fill up those liquidity pools. I think it'll be a really exciting time. 
It'll be a way to really understand what we're doing. But by joining the Discord, you also can take part in building what we're building and and be uh, one of the first members to help build out. And, you know, obviously this is why you're watching Adam's show because he finds the good projects early. And and this is exactly what you found is, um, you know, a solid project. Yeah, we don't have a picture of a dog on the coin, but we are a, a serious project with a serious team and uh, we're, we've got a serious mission. And I think it's a mission that's needed right now, especially after the collapse of some of these experimental things like Terra Luna, which which I predicted in 2019 publicly, saying that this is just another algorithmics coin that will fail in it. And if it fails and it gets really big, it's going to be very, very dangerous for the industry. And this is why we're building a proper stable that's truly uh, backed by other cryptos. And some people will say, well, it's not, it's, uh, you know, not capital efficient, which is the big buzzword that these algorithmic stable coins use. But I don't know if losing like billions of dollars is very capital efficient, which Luna did. So definitely come and join us. We're, we're a great friendly bunch uh, on Discord and uh, we're, we're going to have lots of competitions and bounties and, you know, referral programs and stuff like that. Um, if, you, if you want to get into it and you don't want to just buy in and you want to be part of the initial founding group. I'll leave links to all of that below. Josh Shigala, I love your work. Thank you for joining me. Talk to you next time. Thanks, Adam. I love your work too, mate. Cheers, mate.